Hello everyone, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be discussing spin systems with antiferromagnetic interactions. The classical Nael state with a staggered magnetization, up, down, up, down, and so on, we will see is actually not an exact eigenstate of the Heisenberg model describing the exchange interaction between quantum spins. In fact, however, um, we can describe these systems in a rather intuitive way using so-called resonating valence bonds. We imagine that between a pair of sites, we have a spin singlet, which is favoured by the antiferromagnetic interaction, an up-down, minus-down-up kind of state. However, um, systems cannot necessarily uh, satisfy all of these spin singlets simultaneously, so we imagine that the system is fluctuating between states with uh, these resonating valence bonds on different pairs of sites. In particular, we'll look at magnetically frustrated systems. For example, the Heisenberg model on a triangular lattice. Here, it's not possible to satisfy all of the antiferromagnetic interactions uh, simultaneously. <clears throat> we'll be talking about that and explaining why that's the case. And then we'll see that this gives rise to a uh, macroscopic degeneracy of the ground state in such systems which suppresses the magnetic order in these systems down to very low temperatures. We'll see that we can discuss these systems and describe these systems in terms of this resonating valence bond theory. And this gives rise to this concept of a quantum spin liquid. We imagine that we have these valence bonds, these spin singlet states between neighboring sites, but that uh, the, the sites involved in these singlet states are fluctuating and resonating throughout the system. So we have a kind of liquid of these spin singlet states. In the second part of the lecture, we're going to consider <clears throat> um, antiferromagnetic spin systems which have exactly solvable Hamiltonians, giving um, precise and exactly solvable ground states. In particular, we'll see that there's a class of these, um, basically given by the generalized AKLT construction, in which we have uh, valence bond solid ground states. This is where we have a product state of these valence bond singlets on neighbouring sites. We'll see that there's a whole class of Hamiltonians that have these as exact ground states and try to understand something about magnetic ordering from these systems. In particular, we'll see that at the boundary of these systems, we have uh, the possibility of topological defects and fractionalization. Well, we'll give a, um, a perspective towards uh, quantum computation and how this might be actually useful as a resource um, in quantum information. So in this uh, lecture, we're going to discuss um, two categories of systems. First, the resonating valence bond, and secondly, the valence bond solid. So let's get down to work. In this lecture, we're going to be considering antiferromagnetic spin systems. In the previous lectures, we've been focusing more on the ferromagnetic side. In this lecture, we'll see that for antiferromagnetic coupling, we can get a different kind of magnetic ordering, resulting in a staggered magnetization. Another important difference between antiferromagnets and ferromagnets is that in the antiferromagnetic case, we have the possibility of magnetic frustration. In the second part of the lecture, we will discuss a class of exactly solvable models, which are referred to as valence bond solids. We will discuss how to construct those models, how to construct the exact ground states, and learn something about fractionalization of excitations. We will start, as usual, with the paradigmatic model for describing uh, spin systems, which is the Heisenberg exchange Hamiltonian. I've written it out here. Uh, we have a sum over sites on the lattice i and j, and then a spin-spin interaction si vector hat dot sj vector hat. Um, this has a particular exchange coupling strength, which we label here jij. So as we discussed in the previous lectures, these jij's here um, basically encode the dimensionality, the connectivity, and the geometry of our lattice. These operators here, these spin operators, are of course quantum mechanical operators for a spin s. Um, we will talk in the first part about spin half, but later on we'll talk about higher s as well. In this lecture we'll be talking about antiferromagnetic spin systems, and therefore we'll assume that the exchange couplings j will be greater than zero. This favours the anti-parallel alignment of neighbouring spins. As an example, let's consider the one-dimensional spin-half chain. 
Here I'm uh, depicting a particular state. It's got anti-ferromagnetic ordering in the sense that I have this staggered magnetization, up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on. This is referred to as the Nayal state. However, as explored in the previous lectures, this Nayal state is not an exact eigenstate of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. It's not the ground state or any eigenstate. That's because contained within this Heisenberg exchange Hamiltonian are spin-flip terms. These terms, for example, lower the SZ projection of a particular spin uh, and it's compensated for by raising the SZ projection of a neighbouring spin. For example, uh, as I've depicted here, the strict up-down, 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 and so on order of the nail state is disturbed by this spin-flip process. The true ground state of the system will be one in which we have a superposition of various states that look a bit like this. In fact, we can get these domains of antiferromagnetism um, separated from other bits uh, by these domain walls where we have two parallel spins. All of these kind of configurations will enter into the superposition for the ground state of this system. Just to emphasize, the ground state of this system is not a pure product state with this pristine antiferromagnetic ordering. We can also consider systems with a different geometry or dimensionality, another classic example being the 2D square lattice. Here we can again imagine having a, a Nial type state with the pristine antiferromagnetic ordering. Every spin, for example, take this one, is surrounded by other spins, its nearest neighbours, of the opposite SZ. Here, too, the pristine antiferromagnetic ordering is not present in the exact ground state of this system. For example, if I flip this pair of spins here, then I see I create a number of domain walls where we have parallel spins here, 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 and here. The true ground state of the system is one that's much more complex. We can, however, still talk about the propensity for magnetic ordering in such systems by looking at spin-spin correlators. For example, if we look at the expectation value of si vector hat dot sj vector hat for a pair of sites on this lattice, i and j, then we can see how that scales with the distance between those two sites. In general, what we would see is that there is an antiferromagnetic ordering but that the strength of those correlations die off as some power law here parameterized by this gamma. If we had pristine antiferromagnetic ordering, then I could say, for example, if this spin here is up, then I know with absolute certainty that this spin over here is up and this one over here is down, for example. In the true ground state, um, it's not so simple. And what we could say is that there is a correlation between the spin on this site and this site but that correlation decays with increasing separation, as one might expect. These correlation functions, and in particular these power laws, really typify and characterize these systems. The situation is somewhat different on the triangular lattice, because here we have the possibility of magnetic frustration. Suppose I imagine spin-half particles on the vertices of this lattice, Imagine that I have some antiferromagnetic ordering along the top row here, up, down, up. How then do I arrange the spins on the other sides to maximize the number of antiparallel bonds? Let's say in the second row, I start off with down, up, down, up. In this configuration, I have antiparallel bonds running along each horizontal line, and also we see antiparallel arrangements of the spins uh, on these bonds. However, if I look on these bonds, I see parallel spins. In fact, it's easy to see that however I try to tile my uh, triangular lattice with up and down spins, I cannot simultaneously satisfy all of the antiferromagnetic bonds, meaning the spins like to be in an antiparallel configuration, but I can't simultaneously satisfy that condition for all of these, uh, these bonds denoted by the blue lines here. However I try to arrange the spins, there will always be these pairs of neighboring sites uh, in which I have uh, the spins in a parallel alignment. We saw that the situation was rather different on the 2D square lattice. There, I could write down an exact product state um, in which all of the pairs of neighbors um, had the anti-parallel configuration. On the 2D triangular lattice, that's not possible. This is referred to as magnetic frustration, and it would also be an issue even in the classical system of spins. The magnetic frustration is a result, therefore, of the competing interactions. To understand this in a little more detail, Let's consider um, a single moiety on this lattice, a single triangle. 
let's consider that following Hamiltonian, we have a constant j between our different bonds. Here I will also assume that j is greater than zero to look at the anti-ferromagnetic case. <clears throat> and then we have spin-spin interactions between the three sites, s1.s2, s1.s3, and s2.s3, thereby forming this equilateral triangle of spins. We can consider a possible spin configuration like this one, in which spins 1 and 2 are in an anti-parallel alignment. But what do we do with the third spin? Do we choose it to be up, thereby making these two anti-parallel, um, but these two parallel, or down, in which case these two would be anti-parallel and these two would be parallel? Energetically, you can see that this remaining spin can be either up or down, and it doesn't make any difference, so there's some freedom there. But there's even more configurations. Imagine that I have spins 2 and 3 in an anti-parallel alignment. Then what do I do with spin number 1? Again, if I choose either up or down spin, I cannot simultaneously satisfy all of the antiferromagnetic interactions. And finally, I can write this spin configuration. It's the same deal. All of these three configurations are basically equivalent, and all of them have this ambiguity as to what to do on the third site. Of course, I'm simplifying the situation a bit here by talking about the simple classical product state configurations of the spins. In reality, something like this up-down here, or this up-down here, are really spin singlets in the quantum mechanical sense. These would be a superposition of up-down minus down-up. That still leaves an ambiguity as to what to do on the third site, however. In both the classical and the quantum case, the magnetic frustration leads to a ground state degeneracy. This is following from the inherent ambiguity of the spin configurations and not being able to simultaneously satisfy all of the anti ferromagnetic interactions. So let's now see the magnetic frustration and the resulting ground state degeneracy in this simple model comprising three spins. For this simple system, we can label our basis states, and indeed our eigenstates, by the total spin and SZ quantum numbers. First of all, let's define the total spin operator, S vector hat, simply as the sum of the spin operators for the three sites, S1, S2, and S3, and likewise for the SZ operator. It's then easy to see that the Hamiltonian commutes with both S squared and SZ. S and SZ are therefore good quantum numbers, and we can label both our basis states and the eigenstates of H according to these quantum numbers. In fact, by considering the usual rules of angular momentum addition, here we're talking, of course, about the spin angular momentum, we can see that this system of three spin half particles will give us two spin half states and one spin three half state. The multiplicity of a multiplet with spin s is, of course, 2s plus 1, so we can easily see that this s equals a half has two states, and this s three half state has four states, and so overall we have eight states, and that is the correct dimensionality of the overall Hilbert space here. We have three spins one half, two to the three equals eight. With antiferromagnetic interactions, the two spin half states are the ground states. The Hamiltonian can be diagonalized to find the eigenstates of the system. This is, of course, equivalent to solving the Schrodinger equation. I'll leave you to have a go at that yourself, but let me write down two of the eigenstates here. What I've written down are the two spin half states with s said plus a half. I've introduced a label or an index here, k equals 1 and k equals 2, to distinguish between our distinct spin half doublet states. You can easily check that both of these are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. They're also eigenstates of the s squared operator and the s said operator. Both of them are spin half states, and both of them have s said plus a half. They're also degenerate with common eigenvalues minus 3 quarters j. You can also check that these states are orthogonal and normalized. I can write that in terms of the overlap or inner product of these two states, which gives me a delta function delta k k primed when looking at a state k in the bra and a state k primed in the ket here. Again, you can confirm that yourselves just to check that it's correct. Okay, so how to interpret these two eigenstates? What do they mean, and what has it got to do with this magnetic frustration? Well, let's have a look at this first state that I've written here. 
I can expand this out in the basis of um, the spin configurations for sites number one, two, and three. And you'll see that both of the two kets in this uh, expression uh, have spin number one pointing up. So let me factorize that out in terms of this direct product notation. We see then that spins two and three are actually in a singlet combination, one over root two, up, down, minus, down, up. We can understand the structure of this state in the following cartoon fashion. Imagine that we have our three spins in the triangle like this. We see that the spin configuration of spin number one up here is in the up configuration, whereas spins two and three are in a singlet. Here I'm using the up down with a red circle around it to mean a singlet combination rather than literally just this product state. This thing is supposed to denote the up down minus down up configuration. Okay, so what about our other state? This seems to be a little more complicated because I can't factorize out uh, a single configuration of an individual spin in this, uh, in this full eigenstate here. Actually, I could write the states in the following way. Imagine that I have a single spin with the, uh, with the up spin configuration, let's say this time on the two side, and then I arrange the remaining spins, in this case the one and threes, into a singlet. In the second term, I do the same thing, but this time I have the spin number three fixed in its up position and spins one and two in the singlet. I have a superposition of these two states, and then overall I have to normalize it by, by some factor. It's easy to check that if I add up all of these terms and write them in terms of these single kets, normalize it properly, then I'll obtain this eigenstate. We can therefore interpret the second eigenstate as a superposition of the following two configurations. The first one with one and three spins in a singlet configuration, and the second one with spins one and two in the singlet configuration. So we see here how the idea of magnetic frustration comes into play. We can arrange this singlet bond here on any of the three axes, but we can't simultaneously make a singlet on all three sides of our triangle. Now you might be wondering why these uh, two states look rather asymmetrical here. Why, for example, in this first eigenstate do I just have a single spin configuration with um, the uh, two and three sites in a singlet, whereas in the second eigenstate I have this superposition of these two? Well, the answer is actually that it's pretty arbitrary. These two eigenstates are degenerate. They have the same energy. That means that any linear combination of these two eigenstates that I've written down will also be an eigenstate. In particular, I can write down an eigenstate that will be any linear combination of these three configurations involving spin singlets on any two of the three bonds. The ones I've written down here are just a specific choice, but they're a choice where we have an orthonormal set. It's important that whatever choice I make, the states are uh, orthogonal to each other and normalized to one. But just to emphasize, it would be a perfectly valid state to consider a superposition of this one and this one, for example, or this one with this one, or some other superposition of all three. I've basically made a gauge choice about how to set this up uh, in these two eigenstates. The specific choice is unimportant to the underlying physics because these two things are degenerate. So the punchline of all of this is that because of the magnetic frustration, we end up with two degenerate ground states. We have a degeneracy in the ground state because we cannot fulfill all of our antiferromagnetic interactions simultaneously. The take home message is that frustration leads to degeneracy. The system cannot choose a unique ground state. This also implies that there will be enhanced quantum fluctuations and we'll be exploring the consequence of that in this lecture. This idea of writing our eigenstates as superpositions of spin configurations where we have singlets on a given bond is actually useful when we go to the lattice generalization. So let's have a look now again at the magnetically frustrated triangular lattice. Let's imagine that I have a spin singlet somewhere on this lattice connecting a pair of neighboring sites. Here, this cartoon is, has a specific meaning I'm taking this moiety here to indicate that we have a spin singlet, which means one over root two of up, down, minus, down, up for the spin configurations of these two neighboring sites. Now I can construct a spin configuration for the whole lattice by simply tiling the lattice using these spin singlet bonds. 
On the infinite lattice, I can arrange these singlet bonds on all possible configurations. In this finite patch, you see here I have one left over, but I'm assuming that's going to be connected to some other state up here that I've just not drawn. Of course, this tiling of the lattice in terms of these spin singlet bonds is very far from being unique. I can choose all sorts of different configurations. For example, I could choose one like this. And indeed, you can probably convince yourself that there's a macroscopically large number of these different configurations. Here I've just illustrated a few of them. The true ground state of these systems will be some linear combination of all of these different configurations. We will have a quantum superposition of these kind of states. Another way of viewing this is as fluctuations in time. We can imagine that the system occupies a particular configuration like this at a given instant in time, and then it quickly evolves to this state, and then this state, and this state, and so on. We have fluctuations of these various bonds between these various configurations, and we imagine that this is happening in time. In this sense, the magnetic frustration is leading to the enhanced fluctuations that I mentioned on the previous slide. Here, the fluctuations are between which pair of bonds are in a singlet state. The eigenstates of our system can therefore be viewed as so-called resonating valence bonds. The idea is that this singlet state here, denoted by this red bubble containing a pair of black sites, is a so-called valence bond. It's like having a chemical bond in the molecule, hence a valence bond. The term resonating valence bonds is meant to indicate these enhanced fluctuations. I imagine that these different spin configurations are in resonance, meaning that we interconvert very rapidly between them. So I imagine that I interconvert between all of these things, they're in resonance, and therefore the valence bonds are themselves resonating. The specific configuration of the valence bonds is changing from this configuration to this configuration. This class of system is often referred to as a spin liquid. This is because we imagine that these uh, valence bonds here, these singlet bonds, are flowing around from position to position. They're moving around each other and flowing, just as one would have with molecules in a liquid. Of course, this is just an analogy. Here we're really talking about a quantum superposition of these states, but we can imagine it as a kind of spin liquid in this very precise sense. Also notice that in each of these configurations, I actually have zero net magnetic moment. All of the bonds in the lattice are in these singlet configurations. This would suggest, in the thermodynamic limit at least, that these different resonating valent bond configurations are suppressing the magnetic ordering and giving us a disordered state rather than a magnetically ordered state. And this is exactly what happens in real materials. So let's discuss these quantum spin liquids in a little more detail. The Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice that we've just discussed is a good example of such a quantum spin liquid. It's locally and globally magnetically frustrated. It has a macroscopic ground state degeneracy. And what I mean here by a macroscopic degeneracy is that the degeneracy is extensive in the lattice size. As I increase the number of sites in my lattice, the ground state degeneracy grows. The enhanced quantum fluctuations between the degenerate ground states also suppresses the magnetic ordering. In particular, quantum spin liquids remain disordered even at very low temperatures. As discussed on the previous slides, quantum spin liquids can be viewed as resonating valence bonds. Each pair is in a singlet, but the pairs are constantly switching. All of the different but equivalent degenerate ground states are in resonance with each other. And although these systems are disordered in some sense, quantum spin liquids actually still have long-range spin correlations. To understand this feature, let's again consider our triangular lattice of spin halves. Consider the following situation. I can actually make up the spin singlets constituting our resonance valence bonds using spins that are not on neighbouring sites. For example, in this case, we have two spins in a singlet, but they're not on neighbouring sites, the singlet state is extended in space. In this example, I have an even more extended singlet state. There's nothing to stop us making our singlet states from sites that are actually well separated in space. All of these things contribute to the superposition of states in the quantum spin liquid ground state. 
In the end, this actually gives us long-range spin correlations. And these are actually a typical feature of quantum spin liquids. In fact, there are many real materials which exemplify this quantum spin liquid behaviour. For example, tantalum sulphide can be understood as a spin system on a triangular lattice, like the ones that we've been discussing. Whereas this compound, which is known as Herbert Smithite, is something that's defined on the Kagame lattice. That's a different kind of magnetically frustrated lattice. And similarly with sodium iridate, uh, we have a system on the hyper Kagame lattice. And there are many, many other examples. So these systems really exist, and some of the smoking gun signatures of quantum spin liquids is their resistance to magnetic ordering down to low temperatures and the long-range spin correlations, as well as the macroscopic ground state degeneracies. These phenomena can all be observed in experiments on these materials. Finally, I want to talk about the spin-on excitations in quantum spin liquids. These so-called spin-ons are the elementary collective excitations above the resonance valence bond ground states. Let's take another look at our favourite example of the triangular lattice. Suppose that I tile my lattice as usual using these spin singlet bonds, but I leave one site unpaired. This site in the middle here has no companion. It's not in a singlet state with any other site in the system, and I'm denoting it here just with this residual spin up state. This single unpaired spin can be regarded as a defect in the resonating valent bond state. This defect obviously costs a finite energy to produce, and therefore it represents an excited state. The finite energy cost for this state arises because the maximal antiferromagnetic pairing of the spins is here not satisfied. We would always lower the energy by arranging this spin to be paired with some other spin in the lattice. If we really have an unpaired spin like this, it's obviously a higher energy state. These spin-ons have interesting properties. Every site of the lattice is occupied by a fermion, which has a charge and a spin. So relative to the resonating valent bond ground state, where we have a single particle located on every site, this spin-on excitation has zero charge, because there's still a spin sitting here, but it has a net spin half. Remember, the resonating valent bond state is one where all of the spins are locked up into singlet states, albeit resonating amongst different configurations, and therefore they have no net spin. So these excitations have a net spin half, as you can see here I've depicted with an up arrow, but they have zero charge. Of course, both of those statements are relative to the resonating valent bond ground state. So these spin-on excitations are actually neither fermions nor bosons. They're kind of new emergent excitations in the system. They have spin but no charge. Another important property is these spin-on excitations are said to be deconfined. Although the excitations require a finite energy to produce, once they're produced, they can actually move freely throughout the lattice with zero energy cost. We have resistantless spin transport. In particular, the resistanceless spin currents allow these systems to be useful for spintronics applications. These are where we can transport the spin from one side of the structure to the other and use it as a quantum information resource, but this transport occurs without resistance. It's very fast and it happens without energy loss. Spintronics devices based on this kind of deconfinement of spin-ons is something that's at the forefront of current research. But why is it that these spin-ons are deconfined? Why is it that we have resistanceless transport of spins across a structure? Well, imagine that I have a specific configuration, like the one I've depicted here, with this free spin located in the center of the lattice. By simply changing which of the states are in a singlet and which states are free, we can actually move this spin onto a neighboring site. This is another completely equivalent configuration, where now I have a spin singlet here, and the free spin has moved over one site. Both of those configurations have exactly the same energy, so it costs no energy to move that spin. There's also no kinetic barrier because all of these configurations are in resonance with each other. We imagine that the system is fluctuating between all of these configurations. And of course, this can happen again and again to move the spin arbitrarily far from its original position. For example, now the spin has hopped onto this position and I'm forming a singlet 
uh, valence bond between this pair of sides. Doing this over and over again allows the defect to move freely throughout the lattice. So it's not only the ground state, but also the excited states that are interesting in quantum spin liquid systems. Next, I want to consider the opposite limit of so-called valence bond solids. In particular, here I want to discuss a class of exactly solvable models where we can construct the exact ground states of the system. As we'll see, these ground states will be so-called valence bond solid states. As you might be able to guess from the name, here we'll be using some of the same kind of ideas as in the case of the resonating valence bond, but instead of now having a liquid of these uh, different states in resonance, we'll now consider a fixed configuration of these valence bonds. The analogy here is that we have a crystalline solid of valence bonds. As a concrete example, let's again consider a spin system with frustrated magnetism. For simplicity, we'll consider a 1D spin half chain, and we'll frustrate this system by using both nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor antiferromagnetic exchange interactions. This is the Hamiltonian that I will consider. I have a 1D chain where I'm summing over the sites labeled by I. I is running basically from minus infinity to plus infinity here. Then we have two terms in the Hamiltonian. The first, parameterized by an exchange coupling of strength J, is the nearest neighbor interaction between a pair of spins, SI dot SI plus one. The second term, parameterized by the exchange coupling J primed, is the next nearest neighbor interaction between sites i and sites i plus 2. If both j and j primed are greater than 0, the system is magnetically frustrated. Why is that? Well, this first term obviously favors an anti-parallel alignment of the spins. We would like something like up, down, up, down, up, down, and so on. However, the anti-parallel alignment of neighboring spins from this term favors a parallel alignment of the next neighboring spins as you can see here, indicated in blue. However, the second term here likes to see next nearest neighbors anti-parallel. This term therefore has nearest neighbors in a parallel configuration. So these two terms are actually working antagonistically against each other. This first term wants nearest neighbors anti-parallel and next nearest neighbors parallel, and the second term has it the other way around. The system is maximally frustrated if both of these two terms are competing equally with each other and have the same magnitude. Obviously, in that case, we cannot satisfy all of the interactions simultaneously. However, instead of considering the point of maximum frustration, let's consider a different and special point where j primed is equal to one half of j. The system is still somewhat frustrated because all of the interactions cannot be perfectly fulfilled, but this point is actually an exactly solvable point of the model. By looking at the exactly solvable point and the ground state of the system in terms of these valence bond solid states, we will actually learn something about these magnetic systems. The frustrated 1D spin half Heisenberg chain with nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor terms in exactly this ratio goes by the name of the Majum de Gauche model. Here is the Hamiltonian written out at this special point. So how can we solve this model? Well, actually, there's a simple trick that will allow us to rewrite this in a different form. The first step is to separate this out into two separate sums. The second step is to split up this first term into two pieces. We simply copy this term and then put a factor of a half before each one of them. Now, here's the trick. Because we have an infinite sum over all lattice sites i here, I can shift this sum by one to the right. This will not affect the sum because I'm summing over all i anyway. This then gives me the following for the second of the two terms. These two terms are actually completely equivalent because we're summing over all i, and i is basically a dummy index. Now you'll see that I have one half j and the sum over i in each of the three terms in this system, with in the first term, the coupling between i and i plus one, in the second term, between i plus one and i plus two, and in the third term between i and i plus 2. I can therefore write the Majum de Gauche model in this alternative form. The final trick is to write this expression in the following form, where we have now the square of the sum of spin operators on three neighboring sites, si vector hat plus si plus one vector hat 
plus si plus 2 vector hat, all squared. The coefficient here is 1 quarter j, and we're subtracting off some constant, where n here is the total number of sites in the system, which is going to infinity. So how did I obtain this expression? Well, imagine expanding out this square here. We will get si squared plus si plus 1 squared plus si plus 2 squared. We'll also get twice all of the cross terms. These cross terms will therefore give us 1 half j, the sum over i, and then exactly these terms that are in, in the original model. But what about si squared? Well, we're talking about spin half particles, and so si squared it gives me an eigenvalue of s into s plus 1, which is 3 quarters. I get that contribution for each of these three terms, and that gives me 9 quarters. Multiplying by this factor of 1 quarter j out the front, I get uh, 9 sixteenths of j. And I get that term for every single uh, i in our sum here. And if we have n terms in the sum, the total contribution is 9 sixteenths j n. This term, of course, doesn't feature in our original model, so here I subtract it off again. Furthermore, we know that constants don't affect uh, the eigenstates of our system, they don't affect the dynamics, this is just a constant, and so we'll actually ignore it in the following. Furthermore, the term in the Hamiltonian here, which is squared, is basically this combined spin of three neighbouring sites on our chain. This is actually sufficient information to now determine the exact ground state of the system, and to show that it's actually of a valence bond solid type. So how does writing the Hamiltonian in this special form give us some insight into the ground state of the system? Well, here let's remind ourselves that we want to pick j greater than zero, which is the antiferromagnetic case, where we have a partially frustrated system. With j greater than zero, the energy is clearly minimized if the total spin on any three neighboring sites is the smallest it can possibly be. Since we're talking about spin half particles, what's the smallest spin we can have for a collection of three spins? We actually discussed this at the beginning of the lecture, and we saw there that from the rules of angular momentum addition, if we're adding three spin half particles, the smallest spin that we can get is a spin half. So the ground state will be the one in which any three neighboring sites are in a spin half configuration. How is this possible? So let's depict our one dimensional chain of spins in the following way. The blue lines here are indicating the exchange couplings between the spin half particles, which are themselves denoted by these black circles. Let's again use our valence bond notation, where a red bubble encapsulating a pair of these black sites represents a spin singlet state meaning 1 over root 2, up, down, minus, down, up, for the spin configuration on this pair of sites. This is, of course, a spin 0 configuration for those two sites. Let's now tile our one-dimensional chain using these valence bonds. The lattice would then look something like this. In fact, it's now clear that this is, in fact, the exact ground state of the Magum de Jost Hamiltonian that I've written here. We can immediately see that by considering any three sites on the lattice. For example, here I'm considering these three consecutive spins. Two of them will be in a singlet state, and one of them will be left over, and therefore will give a spin half contribution. This is exactly what we want to minimize the total energy. For three neighboring spins, we'll have always a spin half state. That's because two of them will be locked up into a singlet, and there'll always be one left over as a free spin. For example, if I consider these three neighbouring spins, I have exactly the same situation. Two of them are in a singlet state, and one of them is left over. That will always be the case, no matter which pair of three consecutive spins I choose. This configuration of valence bonds therefore clearly gives me the lowest possible energy, because the total spin on any three sites is the smallest it can be, which is spin one half. Therefore, the total energy of this Hamiltonian will be the smallest that it can be and the state with the lowest energy is the ground state. The exact ground state is therefore a product state of these neighbouring singlets. These are the valence bonds of our system, and the chain therefore becomes dimerized in terms of these bonds. This is the so-called valence bond solid, because we basically have a frozen configuration of the valence bonds 
of these singlets on neighbouring sites. Each singlet involves entangled spins on neighbouring sites. This is definitely a quantum mechanical effect. But they are not resonating and fluctuating with other valence bonds, as in the spin liquid. The correlations in such a system are inherently very short-ranged. The expectation value of the spin-spin correlation between sites i and j is precisely equal to zero unless i and j are nearest neighbours on the one-dimensional chain. We can now write our ground state in the following exact product state form. We have a singlet state for sites 1 and 2, with the direct product of the singlet states on sites 3 and 4, with the direct product of singlet states on 5 and 6, and so on. Finally, I want to discuss localised edge states in the Magumda Joss chain. Here, we're going to focus on the boundary effects in a finite chain. So imagine that I just have a finite bit of the chain. Here, I've drawn an illustration with 10 sites in the chain, but we can have this with an arbitrary number of sites in general. On the previous slide, you might have been wondering whether it matters where I put my valence bonds. In the infinite chain, it doesn't matter. However, if one has a finite strip of the chain, then clearly it does make a difference. I can imagine two distinct tilings. For example, in this upper case, we have all of the five pairs in valence bonds. In the lower case, um, we have only four of the five pairs in valence bonds, and there are two left over at the ends of the chain. In the second example, the states at the end are basically free spin-half excitations. They're not coupled into a valence bond, and therefore they remain a free spin-half. In fact, these two states are not energetically equivalent. The upper one, with all pairs in valence bonds, is actually of a lower energy. The first excited states on top of that ground state are the ones where we have these excitations, these spin-half particles, lying at the ends of the chain. In the next example, I'll actually show you a system where we have a fractionalization of the fundamental particles in our system, and that there are zero energy states perfectly localized at the boundary of the system, even in the ground state. This will be our first encounter with topology in quantum matter, and it's a topic that we'll return to later on in the course. The next example I want to talk about in this lecture are the so-called AKLT chains. This is an acronym named after the inventors of this model, Affleck, Lieb, Kennedy, and Tasaki. These actually constitute a whole class of systems with exact valence bond solid ground states. It's a formulation that puts the previous analysis on a more general footing. There's a whole family of these models, but I'll just consider a specific one that's particularly insightful. This is the Hamiltonian that I want to study on the next few slides. It looks like a rather weird object. It's a one-dimensional chain with a constant exchange coupling J, which is assumed to be anti-ferromagnetic, J greater than zero. And we have a sum over sites I of our chain, running from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then we have a bunch of terms. There's a constant, which we can basically ignore, but I'll keep it in for now. We have a nearest neighbor exchange coupling, and then we have this funny term, which is a nearest neighbor exchange coupling squared. And the coefficients here, a third, one half, and one sixth, are actually crucial to obtaining the exact valence bond solid ground state. Finally, it's important to mention that these SI vector hat operators are actually spin one operators in this model. That means that the local Hilbert space for a single spin is actually three dimensional, the z-projection of the spin can take values of minus 1, 0, or plus 1 on every site in the system. Notice then that the combined spin on a neighbouring pair of these spin 1 sites can be either 0, 1, or 2. Of course, this Hamiltonian is a bit of a contrivance. Why would we look at this particular thing? Does it relate to a particular system in, uh, in the real world? Well, the answer is that it doesn't really relate to a particular material, um, as such, but it does teach us something interesting about the nature of these magnetically frustrated spin systems. So we'll study it as an abstract model. It will teach us something useful, I hope. Furthermore, even though I will discuss the exact valence bond solid ground state of this system, one can consider more general systems that really might model real materials as simply perturbations to uh, the exact state uh, given by this system. So first, 
Let's consider two neighbouring spin 1 sites. Let's say we're looking at sites number 1 and 2. We can label these by the combined spin of these two sites, which is just given as the sum of s1 vector hat plus s2 vector hat. I'll denote this combined spin operator s12 vector hat. Let's label the states of our two neighbouring spins by their combined spin s12. I'll denote that with this ket. If I now act on that ket with my s12 squared operator, it should return the combined spin eigenvalue s12 into s12 plus 1. Now, for our two neighbouring spin 1 particles, the combined spin can either be 0, 1, or 2, by the usual rules of addition of spin angular momentum. Let's now define some projectors onto the states with a definite spin for the pair of sites 1 and 2. In particular, I'll define P0 as the projector onto the spin 0 state. Here I just have the bra for S12 equals 0 state and the ket for the S12 equals 0 state. And similarly for the projector onto the spin 1 state, which looks like this, and the projector onto the spin 2 state, which looks like this. So let me remind you what I mean by these projectors. Imagine that I act with a projector P0 onto the state with the combined spin equals 0. The result of that, due to the orthonormality condition of these kets, is equal, of course, to the S12 equals 0 state. However, if I act with the P0 operator on the S12 equals 1 state, I will get 0. And if I act with the P0 operator on the S12 equals 2 state, I also get 0. I can, of course, repeat the procedure by acting with the P1 projector onto the states and acting with the P2 projector onto the states, and I would see something very similar. In fact, let me write out a table that summarizes this information. Let's say on the left here I have the states with S12 equals 0, 1, and 2. This is defining all the possible spin states for our neighboring pair of sites. And then on the top here, I'm describing these various operators. There's S12 squared, and then the projectors P0, P1, and P2. In the table here, I'm giving the eigenvalues of these operators acting upon these states. For example, S12 squared acting on the spin 1 state gives me an eigenvalue S into S plus 1, and for S equals 1, that gives me an eigenvalue of 2. Likewise, if I act with the P2 operator on the state with spin 1, I get 0. Only the state with spin 2 gives me an eigenvalue of 1 of the P2 operator. OK, so what's the point of all of this, and how does it help us? So with this table at hand, let's now try to express our P2 projection operator onto the combined spin 2 state in terms of the combined S12 squared operator. I will argue that I can write as an operator identity that p2 hat is equal to 1 over 24 times s12 squared into s12 squared minus 2. Why on earth would this be the case? First of all, consider this factor s12 squared. From the table, I know that if I apply s12 squared to the spin 0 state, that then I get an eigenvalue of 0. So, the fact that this projector P2 contains this factor S12 squared means that if I were to operate with P2 on the spin 0 state, then it would give me this 0 eigenvalue. And actually that's independent of whatever's going on in this second factor here. So this factor here annihilates the S12 equals 0 states. Likewise, the factor S12 squared minus 2 will annihilate the spin 1 states. That's because the eigenvalue of the S12 squared operator when acting on a spin 1 state gives me 2. So S12 squared minus 2 will give me 0 if I'm acting upon the spin 1 state. So the two factors that I see in here actually annihilate both the spin 0 and spin 1 states. All I have left is the spin 2 state. So this is therefore a projector onto the spin 2 state. 
it will only give me the spin two state back again. It will give me zero if I have a spin one state or a spin zero state. Okay, so this factor of one over 24 just gives me the normalization. That's because if I actually act with the P2 operator on our spin two state, then this first term will give me an eigenvalue of six, and this second term will give me an eigenvalue of six minus two equals four. So six times four is 24, and I need this leading coefficient one over 24, so that the eigenvalue of P2 comes out correctly as one when I act on it with the S12 equals two state. Okay, so that's a little bit convoluted, but hopefully you understand the logic. I can then express this P2 operator in terms of our individual spin operators for site number one and two in the following way. And that's because the S12 operator is simply the sum of S1 plus S2. So S12 squared involves S1 plus S2 dotted into itself. If I expand this out, I will get twice the cross terms, 2 S1 dot S2, which is this term. And then I will get S1 squared plus S2 squared. But here we're talking about spin 1 particles. So S1 squared will give me S into S plus 1 equals 2. I have that for both of the particles, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. So expanding this all out, I obtain the following expression. The projector onto the spin 2 state of a neighbouring pair of sites can be given as 1 third plus 1 half of S1 dot S2 plus 1 sixth of S1 dot S2 all squared. And of course, this is very closely related to what we had in our original Hamiltonian. We can now write the AKLT Hamiltonian simply as a sum of projectors onto the spin 2 space of a pair of nearest neighbour sites, i and i plus 1, and then summing over all sites on our one-dimensional chain. Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb and Takasi, who came up with this Hamiltonian, basically started from this projector, and then wrote the Hamiltonian out in terms of these spin operators. In this lecture, I introduced it the other way around. I talked about the Hamiltonian first, and then I showed that it could be written in terms of these projectors. But in general, we can consider constructing Hamiltonians from these kind of projectors and exploring what kind of physics they have. And this is precisely what is at the heart of these AKLT constructions. So you can see there's a whole family of these. You could imagine also a model where we had a projector onto the spin one states or a Hamiltonian with some arbitrary spin and other kinds of projectors entering in here. The specific example is the one that I wanted to talk about here with this AKLT chain with spin one particles and the Hamiltonian consisting of projectors onto the combined spin two states of neighboring pairs. So, so far we've understood something about how to rewrite the Hamiltonian as a sum of projectors. The question now is what is the ground state of such a system? We will obtain the lowest energy if all neighboring pairs of spin ones are in their combined spin zero or singlet configuration. This will be the ground state because then the Hamiltonian will annihilate all of those states. This is a projector onto the spin two space of neighboring spins. If all neighboring spins are in a spin zero configuration, this projector will annihilate it and give us zero energy contribution for that state. You might wonder why we can't arrange for our neighboring pairs to be in a spin one configuration. They would also be annihilated by this spin two projector. But as it turns out, it's actually impossible to have every neighboring pair on the lattice in a spin one configuration. Whereas we can achieve every pair being in a spin zero configuration. Let me show you now how that works. The question is, how do we guarantee that all of these neighboring pairs of spin one sites end up in a combined S equals zero configuration? So here I'm depicting our one dimensional chain of spin one particles. Now, instead of considering each of these particles as a spin one object, let's consider it as two spin half particles locked up in the triplet S equals one configuration. We can then represent our spin one chain in the following form, where each of these units with this uh, blue square box around two black dots represents a spin triplet S equals one configuration. 
This is just a cartoon shorthand notation for the following three degenerate states of spin half particles, up, 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 down, plus, down, up, and down, down. These are the three components of the S equals one triplet. In particular, each of the dots here represents a spin half particle, whereas in the original model, each of these dots represents a spin one particle. We showed in a previous lecture that a spin one particle is mathematically identical to two spin half particles locked together in this spin triplet configuration. So therefore, we have an alternative representation of our spin one chain in terms of pairs of these spin half particles, each of which being locked into this spin triplet configuration. How does this help us? Let's now introduce again our spin singlet cartoon. I imagine that if I have two spin half particles in this red bubble here, this represents the spin singlet s equals zero configuration, which looks like one over root two up down minus down up. The interesting thing is that I can repartition my chain. Originally, I had this dimerized form um, with these neighboring spin half particles in this representation locked up into the spin triplet. But now I can imagine drawing these red bubbles to indicate a spin singlet comprising one of the spin half particles from each of the neighboring blue boxes. Each of these blue boxes, of course, represents the spin one configuration of two spin halves. We take one of the spin halves from each of neighboring uh, boxes and form from them the spin singlet state. You might be wondering if this is possible, but in fact, it's certainly possible because if we take two neighboring spin one objects indicated by these blue boxes, we can form a spin zero configuration of those two things. And that's exactly what these red bubbles are supposed to be indicating. It's just that we're conceptualizing this as breaking the spin one down into two spin half particles. The spin zero states are then just a redimerization of these spin half particles on the chain. The state with all of these spin half particles on neighboring sites now locking up into spin singlets is then illustrated in this way. Affleck, Kennedy, Lieb, and Tasaki argued that this must be the exact ground state of this Hamiltonian. And as you can see, this is a kind of valence bond solid. We have these singlet states, these valence bonds, which span the whole chain. It's just that we've formulated our spin ones in terms of these pairs of spin halves. But in this language, um, the state that I've drawn here is indeed a valence bond solid. Also, as argued on the previous slide, this must be the lowest energy state, the ground state of the system. The Hamiltonian consists of a projector onto the spin two configuration of neighboring sites. And as you can see here, all of the neighboring sites are in a spin zero configuration. That's what these red bubbles are telling us. Therefore, the Hamiltonian, which projects onto the spin two configuration of nearest sites, will give us an eigenvalue of zero for this state. That is actually the lowest possible energy in this system. And therefore, this is the ground state. By locking up each spin half pair into a singlet, we guarantee that neighboring spin one pairs cannot combine into a spin two state. Therefore, this valence bond solid state is a zero energy eigenstate of the Hamiltonian and is in fact the ground state. This idea of separating out our original spin one particles into two spin half particles in a triplet configuration might seem rather artificial and just like a mathematical trick. However, I want to convince you that this is a real physical thing. And actually, this relates to an important topic in modern quantum condensed matter physics called fractionalization. And it has to do with topological defects that appear in this system at the boundaries. Consider now not an infinitely long chain of spin one particles, but a finite chain. Here I'm imagining that I have a boundary where the chain is cut on both ends. According to the AKLT construction, the lowest energy state, the ground state of this system, will be the one in which we dimerize these um, effective spin half particles in these neighboring blue boxes into effective spin singlet configurations, as denoted by these red bubbles. However, you can see that at the ends of the chain, we will have a single unpaired effective spin half particle. Because the ground state of our many particle spin system has this valence bond solid kind of structure, 
That implies that at the end of our chain, we must have these effective spin half particles and that they're basically free. What I mean by free is that they're local moments that are not coupled to anything else in the system. They're zero energy states and they're pinned and perfectly localized to the boundary of this system. This really is a physical effect. These free, uncoupled, effective spin half particles at the boundary of the system can really be directly measured. For example, if you did a numerical calculation of this system and measured the uh, spin susceptibility at the end of the chain, you would see that these are free local moments. These are topological because they depend on the coupling in the rest of the system. To get rid of these free spin half particles at the boundary, you'd have to do something drastic to the whole system to destroy this valence bond solid ground state. There is some information in the system that is stored non-locally here in order to obtain these localized boundary states. To get rid of these states, we'd actually have to go through a phase transition and change the ground state of the system radically. This is an example of fractionalization because we started off with single spin one particles and we end up with excitations in the system that are actually behaving like spin half particles. Again, this illustrates the point that in many body quantum condensed matter physics, the laws that are governing our system are not necessarily the microscopic laws that we started out with. As Anderson said, more really is different. These considerations relate to a whole field of study in modern quantum condensed matter physics relating to topological quantum matter. Finally, I'll comment that the AKLT chain is obviously a very special and peculiar system which has an exact valence bond solid ground state. However, it is representative of a wider class of system that shows these effects of topological defects and fractionalization. The AKLT system is nice because it has an exact solution and we can understand the nature of these topological defects. In fact, earlier, Haldane actually showed that the regular spin one Heisenberg chain has the same fractionalization and topological spin half edge states even though the ground state of that system is not exactly the valence bond solid state. This is called the Haldane spin gap problem, and the concepts of fractionalization and topological protection of localized surface states in this system has been incredibly important and influential in physics, and is today a huge area of modern research, with proposed applications to quantum computation. And there'll be more on that later. Haldane won the 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics for his research in this area, and it really started with this seminal result. So, in summary, in this lecture we have considered spin systems with antiferromagnetic interactions. In the first part, we saw how this could give rise to magnetic frustration, which manifests as a ground state degeneracy in these systems. The classical Niall state, with a pure staggered magnetization, is not the exact eigenstate of these systems. However, one way of understanding the eigenstates of these systems is in terms of so-called resonating valence bonds, where we consider singlet states of spins on neighbouring sites, but these singlet states are fluctuating between different sites. In some systems, for example the Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice, we have the phenomenon of a quantum spin liquid, this is a system with a macroscopic ground state degeneracy and a high level of frustration that suppresses the magnetic ordering in those systems, even down to very low temperatures. We understand the ground states of those systems in terms of resonating valence bonds. In the second part of the lecture, we considered a class of exactly solvable models, which can be regarded as valence bond solids. These are product states of these valence bond singlets. A certain class of Hamiltonian will give these valence bond solid states as exact ground states. In these systems, we see that if we cut the chain and consider the boundary, we often see topological defects, which can exhibit the phenomenon of fractionalization. Of course, there's much more to say about this vast topic, but in this lecture course, this is as far as we'll go. In the coming lectures, we're going to change gear and discuss fermionic systems where the electrons can really move around on a lattice. We can discuss the dynamics in terms of the propagation of the electrons through the many-body system, as well as just the spin dynamics. We will see that in a limit of the Hubbard model describing those fermionic systems, we obtain the Heisenberg model that we've been discussing in these lectures.
and this will bring us full circle.